Good morning, everyone. We're working on it. It's good to see you this morning. We're glad that you're here. Glad that you're a part of our services this morning. Have a few folks out, and that's all right. We want to remember them. Uh, ask around. If you don't know about their situation or why they're not here, just ask them. Those of us that if we do know, we'll tell you. And if we don't know, we'll tell you something. No, we'll, we'll tell you we don't know. We'll tell you we don't know, uh, but we'll want to check on them this week. You did get, as Jay said, you got to most of you, if not all of you, got to save the date. A uh, little reminder of May 22nd, we're having Friends and Family Day. We've got a bunch of these, and we can make a bunch more. So pick up, a, they're out in the foyer. Just pick up as many as you want. You can mail them, and you can put them, put a little note with them if you want to and put them in an envelope, or you can mail them. We can also, if you want some paper ones, we can get you some paper ones. These are out of card stock, but we can uh, do that as well. But get the word out to your friends and your family because we want them here, May the 22nd, to be a part of our, our friends and family day and enjoy the, the fellowship, enjoy the worship service together, and enjoy, of course, the, the fellowship meal that follows uh, all of that. But we look forward to that and hope that you do as well. We'll be mentioning that from time to time and uh, want you to be mindful of that. And, and uh, like I say, invite friends and family, remind them that it's coming up. Uh, I understand somebody's having a birthday that day, and since it is, you know, maybe somebody will bake a, a, a birthday cake for them. You reckon somebody will bake a cake for you, Larry? Might. <laughs> it's touch and go, but uh, we'll, we'll do something, won't we? So we'll have to remember that. But, uh, you know, we're throwing a friends and family day for Larry. <laughs> but we're glad that you're here this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, you might want to turn to Acts chapter 24. We'll get there in just a second. As we're going to look at a lesson entitled, a sermon we need to hear. Uh, all sermons, you know, in preacher's estimation, all sermons are sermons you need to hear. But there's an interesting sermon in Acts chapter 24, verse 25. And yet we don't have the, if you will, we don't have the, the what's called in preacher terminology, guts of the sermon. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, we're glad that you're here and hope that uh, you, do, you did have a great week. Do remember our folks in Ukraine, remember the brethren that are there. We have many brethren there, by the way. And uh, we have, I have some, some preaching acquaintances that serve over there from time to time in campaigns and go over there for, for periods of time. And thankfully, all of them that I know are safe, and ho either home or one, as I talked about in class today, is in Poland. He did have to flee. He was in the Ukraine at the time. But uh, the last report I had of him was in Poland, so he had gotten safely uh, to a point of safety, and we're thankful for that. But do remember those folks in your prayers this week. I'm sure that they would greatly appreciate that and greatly appreciate being remembered in your prayers. There's a story that uh, two young boys, matter of fact, best I recall, it's not, well, it's not just a story. It actually occurred because I know the kids. But I think they were, at the time, they were about nine and about five, somewhere in that, that age range, maybe, uh, give or take a year or two. But there was a gospel meeting going on, and it was Monday night, and mom was having to pile them in the car. Dad worked the evening shift, and so he was not available. And so mom is piling these two boys, loving boys, great boys, into the car. And the youngest one says... Why are we going to go to church? And mom says, what? Well, why are we going to go to church? We went yesterday. Well, we're having a gospel meeting. And so we're going to church tonight. Well, well why? Well, we're going there to listen about God and about his word and to encourage one another. And if someone wants to obey the gospel, we're going to be there to help them. And we're just going there to, to be spiritually fed. Well, I don't know why we went yesterday. That certainly cert seems like that was enough. And the oldest little boy, who was always the, the Eddie Haskell, still is as far as I know, the Eddie Haskell of the family, he says, I'd love to go to church. I'm just so thankful that we get to go, that we get to hear another sermon from God's Word. Well, I'll ask you a question. Don't answer this publicly because probably it'll take you time, but how many sermons have you heard in your life? How many sermons have you heard? Some of you would say thousands. Some of you, 
if you were honest, say, well, I went to thousands, but I only heard a couple of hundred. You know, I slept through some of them. That's all right. But you've heard sermons in your life, one to a million, if not more. How many of them do you remember? Well, I remember bits and pieces of this one and that one, but I don't really remember them all. Well, that's fine, too, because if I were to ask you how many meals have you eaten in your lifetime, you might say, well, I've eaten, you know, figure up three meals a day. And when I was Bo's age, I tried to eat five or six. And, you know, mom tried to stick, you know, several in me. And uh, you figure that up times the number of years and you say, OK, this is how many I've eaten. But how many of them do you remember the full menu of? Suzanne and I went out Friday night. We ordered something. They brought it to us. I couldn't remember what I'd ordered. The waitress looked at me. And she said, you forgot, didn't you? I said, uh-huh. <laughs> but there's a sermon in Acts chapter 24 that's interesting. Paul has finished his three missionary journeys by now. He's finished. He has, has still and is still active in the, the kingdom of God. But he has been accused, he's been accused of being a troublemaker. He's been accused of creating problems. He's been accused of blasphemy. He's been accused of being a righteous man. He's been accused of really, by the Jews, of teaching things that are contrary to their teachings. And so he's a troublemaker. They take Paul, they arrest him. And he's taken before a procurator. A procurator basically was a governor. He was taken for Felix. Not only was he taken before Felix, but he's also, if you notice, he was taken there to his wife as well. Now, you, you got to understand that she came from a line of folks that did not love Christianity. They thought that they could do several things. They thought that they had, as they being the Jews, thought in taking Jesus before him that, lo and behold, while he would understand the, Jew, the Christian's way, that he was not sympathetic to Christianity. And they would finally get rid of Paul. You have to understand that Drusilla, who Paul also stood before, the procurator's wife, if you will, the governor's wife, that she came from a family that really didn't like Christians. Her great-grandfather was the Herod that tried to kill all the babies and tried to kill Jesus. Her great-uncle was the man that killed uh, John the Baptist. And her father was the one who had James first killed. So you see, she came from a line of folks that they really didn't like Christians and they were trying to get rid of them. And yet, Paul stood before them. And it says in Acts 24 that he reasoned with them, that he spent time thinking through and talking through. And there are three things that Paul reasoned with them, righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come. Those would be the points. Those would be the things. And what he said underneath them, we have no way of knowing because the Scriptures don't tell us. We're going to try to fill in those things, maybe not so much in trying to guess what Paul said, but just in taking those three things that Paul reasoned together with them and say, hey, here's what we need to think about. Because Paul reasoned with them of righteousness. But what is righteousness? Well, righteousness can be defined in a lot of different ways. You might find, define righteousness as right doing. You might define righteousness as, as doing what you've been told to do. But it's also a sense in which righteousness is looked at as being or having received a stamp of approval. In other words, while this is a legal term used mostly by lawyers, it is from the standpoint of when one looks at something and deems that it is good, deems that it has been done complete, that it is well, in biblical terms, it might be considered righteous. 
or righteousness. And so, from the standpoint of when we think of righteousness, when we see that God is a God that the psalmist reminds us in Psalm 11 and verse 7, that he loves righteousness, that he is righteous, and that he loves righteousness. That we see that God is a God that does what's good, and God loves those who do what is good and right. And so righteousness is then what we would say is right doing. You know, the Bible reminds us that that's really what God expects of us. Micah, the prophet of old, in Micah, the sixth chapter and verse eight, Micah asked the question, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. God, simply put, Micah says, Micah so concisely puts it, God simply wants you to do what he's told you to do. God not only just wants you to do what he's told you to do, but God wants you to walk with him day by day. God wants you to have that relationship with him that understands him, that understands who he is and what he's about, for he's revealed himself through his word. And so that's the expectation of God. That just as Christ, according to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, just as Christ died in the flesh, we too are to be dead in the flesh, that we should no longer, verse 2 says, that we should no longer spend our time in the flesh after the works of men, but for the works of God. You see, Peter would remind us, it's not about, if you will, it's not about us. It's not about what we want. It's not about our things. But we should spend our time upon this world thinking about God and His ways. What does He want? What does he expect? And so God's expectation is is that we live with him, that we live for him, that we walk with him. And as Paul stands for, he simply gives a sermon that he's simply telling them, here's God's expectation of you. God simply wants you to listen to what he has to say. He wants you to follow his will. But preacher, does that still hold today? You used an Old Testament passage. Oh, yeah. How about Titus chapter 2, verse 11? We like that one. Paul talks about the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Teaching, verse 12, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly. Catch the next word. Righteously. That we should live the way God would have us to live. You see, that's God's expectation of us. That we should live for and with God. That we should be uh, Christians that put Him first. Not the world and not the things of the world, but put Him first. And so as Paul stood, he reminded, if you will, he reminded old Felix. Here's what God expects of you. Oh, you may be living it up. You may live the way you want to live, and you may live the way the world would have you to live. You may live to the point of of having it and doing it your way. God's expectation is that you do it His way. But if you're sitting there like Felix, and you're wondering, okay, is he right? You wonder, can I do this? And how can I do it? You see, as I sit there and and I read the Bible and it talks about the righteousness of God. And it talks about I am to be righteous. I ask myself, how can I accomplish that? Well, first of all, we have an example. We have a pattern. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul reminded the church at Thessalonica, be followers of me and be followers of Jesus Christ. We have an example that we can follow. We have a pattern, if you will, but we have an example to follow. You see, sometimes it's easy to follow an example. It makes it, if you will, something that we can see and something that we understand and something that we can do. 
We learn by looking. We learn by watching. We learn by seeing. And we look at Jesus. And so when the Hebrew writer says, look to Jesus, he's not just talking about look to Jesus for guidance, but he's saying look to Jesus as your example for guidance. For just as he is holy, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, we're to be holy. Not only does God reveal or God give us Jesus, but he, he gave us his word. He gave us his word and he tells us and he shows us, here's the word and the word will lead you to righteousness. In Psalm 17, the psalmist is talking about the greatness of God. He's talking about God and his power and God and his might. And he says, because of the words of your lips, I'm staying far away from the paths of the destroyer. In other words, the psalmist is saying, God, because of your revealed will, because what you've told me, we have it in the word. He says, I'm able to stay away from Satan. So we have an example. We have God's word. You might say, yeah, I have all that. But you know, sometimes I get weary. Sometimes I get tired. God gives us strength. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. He would strengthen you with might by His Spirit in the inner man. You see, God strengthens us. At times in which we say, that way of righteousness is just too hard for me. That's something I can't do. That's something I can't accomplish. The reality of it is, is, oh yes you can, because God is willing and able to give you the strength that you need. He's blessed you with every blessing. For you have all, you and I have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. We have then the promise that, that God would give us these things that we need. He's, got, he's given us the fact that, that He's given us the courage that we need, the boldness that will help us. We have also at our dispense and disposal, we have the privilege of prayer. Because it's the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man that avails much. James 5, verse 16. And so you see, when Paul set this out and says, okay, you've got you've to be righteous before God. And we say, okay, we've got to do what God says do. We've got to do it the way God says do it. And do it because we want to do. We want to serve God and honor God. We say, well, can we do it? And God says, sure. I gave you my son. I gave you my word. I give you my strength. I've given you every advantage that you need in life to make it happen. And so, as Paul reasoned, he reasoned not out of an impossibility, but he reasoned out of a possibility. And he simply said, here's the way. Here's, here's what, what God expects. But many people or like the, the tragic story of the two fishermen that went out fishing one day. And as they were out fishing, they had been out on the water for quite a period of time, and all of a sudden, a storm rolled in. They were unaware, and they realized as they began to see the clouds forming, they began to see that the storm was coming. They realized the, the threatening amount of danger that they were in because they realized how far they had gotten away from where their car and their trailer was to put their boat back on it. And so as they tried to race and outrace the storm and race back, sadly their boat hit a wave and they turned over. One man out of the two, one was saved. The second one was not. A few days later as folks were talking to the one that was saved, they asked him, they said, how come your buddy didn't make it? And he said, because when we got in the boat in the morning, he said, I handed him his life jacket and I put mine on and he threw his in the bottom of the boat and he never put it on. And so when the boat turned over, he said, I popped right back up, but he never came back up. He said, I don't know exactly what happened to him, but he didn't come back up. So many folks go through life 
saying, I understand righteousness, but, you know, I'm not willing to take that on. And so they toss it aside. But those that are willing to do the very best that they can, oh, we are not perfect, but to do the best that we can, we find ourselves to be pleasing to God. And so Paul reasoned, first of all, of righteousness. But then the second thing that he reasoned of, we're told in Acts 24, is he reasoned of self-control. What is self-control? What is it? Self-control is just as we think and as we use it. It's the idea of being able to control yourself, control your thoughts, control your actions, to have yourself under harness enough that you can say, you know, I may be tempted but I'm not giving in. That my actions are controlled by me instead of <clears throat> me being controlled by my actions. Self-control is the ability to say no. Self-control is the ability to sometimes tell everybody else no. Self-control is to simply say, oh, I realize what the world does, but that's not what I'm going to do. Now, I want you to think for a minute about this couple that Paul's in front of. Drusilla had been, was married at, actually at the time when Felix came to her and seduced her. She was a young girl, probably, <clears throat> history tells us, around 16 years of age, somewhere in that neighborhood, middle teen years, when he seduced her away from her husband. This was a couple that knew nothing about self-control. This was a couple that knew nothing about limiting themselves. Wide open was the way they lived their life. Wide open to the point of doing whatever they wanted to do, ever how they wanted to do it. There was no control. Not just a little control, there was no control. And so as Paul reasoned, he reasoned of self-control. Why? Because that's where Satan begins. While James would remind us, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. God cannot tempt any man. James reminds us in verse 14, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. It's his own desires. God, or rather Satan, excuse me, comes at us with with using our desires, our wants, our plans. And he says, hey, I can make this better for you. I can shine this up. This will be great. You will love this. You'll love doing this. You'll appreciate this. This is fun. This is great. And Paul says, hey, folks, you got to control yourself. And so as he explained what it was, he explained what it included. I'm sure, that it included, first of all, that their body must be in control, that their eyes and their ears and their hands and their feet don't do necessarily what is their will, but what is God's will. That they're willing to do what God wants them to do. That there's control enough of self that says no when Satan comes knocking at the door. That when Satan tempts them through the, the idea of their eyes or through the idea of their ears, that they say no, they stay away from the things that are wrong in God's sight. And so you have the body, but you also have the mind that must be controlled. Why? Because therein is where it all begins. Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, casting down every imagination and high thought. That does what? That goes, to paraphrase, that goes beyond and exceeds God's will. You see, Paul says you limit your, your if you will, you limit your mind, you limit your thinking. Why? Because as a man thinks so easy, that's what he becomes. And so self-control is where we limit what our body does. We limit what our mind thinks, and we limit what our tongue does. Our tongue can get us in a lot of trouble, can't it? Our tongue can, can create trouble, can create problems. Our tongue, really, James, James was right. The tongue can no man tame. It's difficult 
Because, you know, sometimes as one man described it many years ago to me, he said, you know, that tongue's wet and sometimes things just slip out. Things just uh, that I didn't mean to say, but I said things that I shouldn't have said that I said. The use of profanity. You don't have to use it. It shows a lack of education in many ways, but second of all, it's, it's interesting because I've been around those that have used profanity. And it's interesting because, you know, here's what happens. People say, well, he's a preacher. Boy, they clean that up right quick. Now, if you can limit your vocabulary around me, you can limit your vocabulary. But then sometimes we use that tongue for gossip, for idle tales that are not true, that are made up by someone, maybe even ourselves. So we're reminded that we need to learn to control our tongue. So our body and our mind and our tongue need to be controlled. That's part of self con- self control, and that's what Paul said. He said, he says, look, you've got to learn to control your very appetites, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those appetites need to be controlled. But you see, if I'm sitting there listening to Paul, I'm wondering, how do I do that? Well, I think, first of all, you've got to want to do it. And by wanting to do it, what you do then is you enthrone Christ as head of your life instead of yourself. So what does that take? Well, that takes a little bit of humility, first of all, doesn't it? To basically say, it's not my way, it's not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was able to do that. As he prayed, Gethsemane, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. It's the idea of what Paul said to the churches of Galatia in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. That I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says, it's not me. It's not me. My life is centered now upon the Lord. My life now is centered upon His ways. And so I enthrone Him as master of my life. But self-control also means that we're willing to say a two-letter word that one little girl came into her mama one day and she said, Mama, Daddy used a curse word. The mother thought for a minute. She said, thought, He doesn't use profanity. She said, honey, what in the world did your daddy say? And the little girl looked at it and she said, my daddy said no. There's a lot of folks like that. Self-control is sometimes having to say no. No to self. No to the desires of the flesh. No to, to what the world says, oh, it's all right. Self-control means then that we're willing to say no. And we're willing to say no to the things that maybe look so pleasurable. And then we, we're willing to, to constantly work at it. Because you see, what, what you control today, you may not control tomorrow. And so Haggai chapter 1, verse 5, says not once, actually, in the book of Haggai, but it says it three times, consider your ways. Think about what you do and think about what's going on. Think about how you live in your life. Consider your ways. And so you have to learn then to be patient. Because as we said, what what you defeat yesterday may not be what you defeat today. And so you have to constantly work at it. You have to constantly strive. You have to constantly say no. You have to constantly remember who's first in your life. And when you do these things, you learn to control yourself and you learn that what you do may have an impact not just upon you, but upon others. That you don't do evil. But Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 15, to consider to consider what is good for yourself and for others. And so as we learn to control ourselves, what Paul said, we learn to say no. 
But then we also think about, as Paul reasoned, he reasoned of the judgment to come. He reasoned of the second coming of the Lord. There's coming the day in which the Lord will, will come again. Scriptures are, are very plain about the day itself. That there's coming an end to this world and all things therein. We know, we talk about the second coming of the Lord in Matthew 25 and 1 Thessalonians chapter, or 2 Thessalonians, excuse me, chapter 1 and, and Revelation uh, chapter 22, 22 a little bit at least, talk about the second coming of the Lord. And we know what's going to happen. As we talk about the coming of the Lord, that day is coming in which we will all be judged. That day of days in which the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and earth's time will be no more for the living will be changed and the dead will rise from the grave and all will stand before the Lord and give an account of what they've done, what they've said, how they've acted. Can you imagine standing before the Lord? Standing before the Lord to be judged judged by what you said. I've shared with his story. It happened my son was 16 and he got a, a, a traffic ticket. He learned a great lesson. He stood before a judge. And the judge knew me and so the judge asked for me as well. I wanted to say, man, I didn't do anything. I'm just sitting back here. But I went up there to be with my son. And the judge talked to him. And if you recall the story, we had some folks that said some really nice things about him. Ethan had just made a little accident. He, he'd gone a uh, uh, school bus. He was going one way, school bus was going the other. The stop sign came out. And for Ethan, it came out a little late. And he just kept going. And that's why he got in trouble. He got in trouble because there was a policeman behind the bus. So nothing, yes, dangerous, but at the same time, not really. Should he have been stopped? Absolutely. I have no problem with the police and what they did. But I think about standing before my Lord. Not standing before Tony Sanders and then we stood before another judge because Tony, knowing us, did not want to, to rule on the decision. So we stood before Judge Bradley later on. But I can only imagine standing before my Lord and saying, Lord, this is what I did. This is how I lived my life. Yeah, I, I didn't, you know, there were times I didn't use self-control when I should have. Lord, you know, there were things that I said and there were things that I did. And I shouldn't have done those things. But Lord, you know, there were times, there were times in which I listened to what you said and there were times in which I followed your word and there were times that I did the very best that I could. And all of that, the Lord will take into account. And so we realize that there is an end game. You see, we have to look at life, and, and one of the things that we do when we look at life is we say, is there an end game? In other words, is there a purpose? Is there a reason? If when I die, is that it, and that's all of it, and, and when I die, I'm finished, and I'm through, and that's, that's all there is to it. Oh, no, you're living so that you can live forever with Him. You're living your life now so that, that eternity will be yours with Him. Oh, yeah, on that day of judgment, there will be a separation. Matthew chapter 25 tells us the separation of the sheep and the goats. And you want to be a sheep. You want to be a sheep because it's the sheep that hear the words, well done. It's the sheep that get to, get to enter in. It's the sheep that are told, come on in, heaven's for you. But you don't want to be the goat. Why? Because goats, even though today in our day and age we use it for greatest of all times, goats are told, depart from me for I never knew you. And spend eternity in hell with Satan. The judgment that's coming serves as the ultimate defining point in our lives 
in which we're able to hear the words, well done, come on in. And so judgment stands for us today as a look at what will be, and it keeps us in the right stead in our life today. But judgment serves not only as, if you will, sort of behavior modification for today, but judgment also calls upon us to realize that there's a purpose for this life. There's a reason for this life. And so while we often want, or from a standpoint of the world, think about grab all the gusto, see all the things you can see, do all the things you can do, the Lord says, oh no, there's something that awaits you that's far better. And so live your life. And so Paul tried to, to get them to understand that there was reason, and there was a reason to follow God. And yet... When it came time, as Paul would have offered the invitation, if you will, do you know what he was told? Go your way. And when I have a more convenient season, I'll call for you. That's what Paul was told. Paul's probably came. The heart may be fluttered. Maybe there was a thought of, of, you know, I need to do what Paul said. But his thought was, not now. Not now. I, I'm not going to do it now. I'll do it later. There was a lady one time. She was very sick, and she went to the doctor. And as she went to the doctor, she told him what her problems were and what she was ailing from and what she was going through. And... and he diagnosed her. He said, I, I'm pretty sure I know what you've got. And he said, I've got the medicine that will make you well. You need to go to the drugstore. You need to pick up the medicine. You need to take it. You need to take the whole thing. And so she left his office. Two weeks later, she came back and she was unable to get any better and he said, you need to take this medicine and take it and, and go. And so she left again. He said, I'm sure that that will make you well. She died two weeks after that. The doctor went to the funeral home for visitation. He said, I just don't understand. He said, I know what she had. And if she'd have taken that medicine, I know it would have made her well. To which the lady's daughter looked at the doctor and said, Doctor, it was not your fault. Said, you prescribed, I'm sure, the right medicine. But she actually went to the pharmacy. She got the medicine. She must have thought that she was smarter than you, for she poured it down the drain. She never took the first dose. And the doctor said, I understand. So many times we come to the Bible with pure motives. Lord, speak to me. I want to know what you got to say. But then we walk away and say, nah, not now, maybe later. But this morning I ask you, where do you stand? Are you a child of God? Do you need to rededicate your life? Our prayer is that if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation this morning, you'll come. All together we stand and sing.